Hello, this is Mr. S, and today we're talking about lecture 2.5, Natural Disruptions to Ecosystems. And the objectives or essential knowledge and skills um, are presented here. Um, we want the enduring understanding for you to be that ecosystems have structure and diversity that change over time. And the learning objective for this lesson is to explain how natural disruptions, both short and long term, impact an ecosystem. The essential knowledge um, are listed here, so um, go ahead and pause the video and read those um, so that you know kind of what you really need to know. Um, so I don't have to read it in the video. And the suggested skill is data analysis, so describing patterns or trends in data which you will do at the end of this video. So a natural disturbance is a natural event that disrupts the structure and or function of an ecosystem. So for example, tornadoes, hurricanes, asteroids, forest fires, drought, anything like that that would really disrupt the um, structure and function and how the ecosystem works. So here's an asteroid, for example. Natural disturbances can be even greater than human disruptions, and they can occur on periodic, episodic, or random time frames. So, for example, periodic occurs with regular frequency, so like during a period of time. So, for example, dry, wet seasons. And episodic are occasional events with irregular frequency, like hurricanes, droughts, fires. It's an episode you could think of. And you could write that in your notes. A peri periodical, you know, periodical means every so often. And episodic means um, that it's an episode. It's something, it's an event. And then random is obviously no regular frequency. So volcanoes, earthquakes, and asteroids. You never know when that's going to happen. So one thing that's really important is there is natural climate change. So Earth's climate has been varied over geological time for numerous reasons. And for example, there's a slight changes in the Earth's orbit and tilt that cause many ice ages and warmer periods. Um, and so here we have um, the cycle of carbon dioxide over 800,000 years and you can see it's gone up and down so much and you can see that the temperature also went up with the increase in carbon dioxide so um, you can see that naturally there's um, a changing climate and major changes in the planet have always happened However, if you look closely at this graph, this was um, this spike happened um, during the Industrial Revolution. And you can see it goes straight up because if this is an 800,000 year time scale, this happened very quickly. And so this is why scientists um, are concerned. Um, many people say, oh, the Earth's climate has always been changing. There's been always been ice ages and we're going towards an ice age, which is partially true. But you can't deny that the emissions have um, drastically increased. And this is a picture of um, how the Earth and the sun get closer together um, and go through periods of time where um, there's times of extreme heat and extreme cold that just exist due to the shape and rotation of these um, solar bodies or planetary bodies. And so environmental change is what disrupts the ecosystem and major environmental disturbances result in widespread habitat changes and or loss. Um, you can even lose the whole habitat. So for example, rising sea level floods, coastal and estuary habitats, um, you can see here salts, salt marsh and mangroves are a very important ecosystem. They buffer against a lot of storms and they provide a lot of essential habitat. 
And with climate change and rising sea levels, um, these can be submerged into water, um, which could completely remove the ecosystem. And so because of these changes, you have migrations. So wildlife may migrate to a new habitat as a result of natural disruptions. So for example, wildebeests migrate to follow rain patterns in African savanna um, because the uh, rain patterns may have changed, then their migration patterns will have to change. Um, ocean species also move further north as the water temperature warms. Um, so we see a lot of animals that we never saw in places happening. And so here's an example of um, the biomass of cal caterpillars. They used to always hatch in a way that coincided with um, these birds, these sparrows. And um, their hatchlings, their peak hatchlings, would match up with the peak caterpillar hatchings in 1980. And this scientist showed that the caterpillar hatchings were happening much sooner because of the temperature changes and that causes these birds to have to migrate um, to get to where they hatch much sooner so that they can get to the caterpillar hatchings and it can cause a major disruption in how this whole system functions because they're really designed to be in sync and be aligned so that these hatchlings have plenty of food. So what are some natural disturbances that could impact ecosystems? What do you think? Take a second, pause, think about it. So we have storms, volcanoes, earthquakes, flooding, mudslides, tornadoes, heat waves, drought, freezing fires, disease, so many things. And there's two different ways that the ecosystem um, responds to these. There's resistance which is the ability to remain unchanged from being subject to a disturbance. So you could think of like a weight, it's like trying to push over a heavy weight. It just doesn't change so much, right? Um, and there's resilience. Resilience would be like trying to push over one of these little bob bobble duties. Um, they're called a weeble wobble. They just pop right back up, right? So it's the ability and rate of an ecosystem to recover from a disturbance and return to its pre-disturbed state. So one is like, doesn't be, it's not affected very easily. It's really resilient. There's not a lot of disasters. And resilience is like lots of disasters can happen and it would just come right back. So, um, you can see, so you can see um, where the, um, which one is resistant and which one is resilient. The resistant, nothing happens in the disturbance until it really affects it in a bad way, right? Whereas resilient, it gets affected and bounces right back. It gets affected again by this disturbance and again comes back, okay? So pause the video and look at this graph, make sure it makes sense. So the intermediate disturbance hypothesis says that ecosystems require a certain level of disturbance for maximum health and diversity. So you see that the diversity is high when it has a threshold of um, somewhat frequent dis disturbances. So like if our forests here in New Mexico they have to have fires in order to be healthy. Um, and maybe that's a rule of nature for all of us. We need something to change it up and to start over, refresh, right? Um, and so if it happens more frequently, also it's the ecosystem adapts more. So I'll move my picture so you can see that. So an example is the intertidal zone um, where there are moderate, predictable, continuous disturbances, so waves and tides, and it leads to high diversity. 
Um, what do you think would happen if there wasn't um, disturbances? Um, well, without any disturbances, eventually a few species would dominate. They would outcompete new organisms. And in addition, with disturbance, the organisms that manage to survive are the healthier ones. So the organisms with less healthy genes will be eliminated. There needs to be a fresh starting over period for every ecosystem so that every animal and organism has a chance to restart and start over, especially if there's one that took over and has gained so much power. Um, you might think we might, us humans might need that too, especially with how our society is functioning these days. All right. And so what makes modern day change with anthropogenic or human causes different from all other nat previous natural changes? Frequency and intensity. So can ecosystems recover from intense infrequent disturbances or frequent mild disturbances? We constantly are interfering with ecosystems in different ways and um, we are pervasive everywhere. All right, so for the end of this lesson, um, there's uh, in your notes, the practice FRQ topic 2.5. I want you to describe the relationship between latitude and change in the first leaf date depicted in the graph. Explain why you think this relationship exists. So, um, change in the first leaf date for honeysuckle trees is shown. The dark orange is eight days earlier. They're blooming eight days earlier. And the dark blue is eight days later. So I want you to look at this information and describe the relation of latitude or distance from the equator and the change in the first leaf date that is depicted in the graph. What can you discern from this based on the latitude and how the, the um, leaf dates are changing? Okay, so go ahead and record that in your notes. And that is all for today. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you have a beautiful day. Hare Krishna.